Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is ministry in Africa, Southern Africa in particular. And my guest is Greg Seegers. Welcome, mm-hmm. Greg. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll tell you just a touch about him. He met his wife, Carlene, who I just met for the first time, through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And That's you've right. been married since 1985, three married sons and five grandchildren. Yeah. So uh, let's hear it for Genesis 1. <laughs> uh, moving their family to South Africa in 1993, they ministered in an African indigenous church movement called, and I'm I'm not sure I'm going to get this right pronunciation-wise, Amazon? Is Amazione? Yeah, it's close. Okay. Amazione. It's, Amazione. But, uh-huh. Okay. In Southern Africa. And well, that covers countries running from Zambia and Mozambique south to uh, South Africa, although I'm just hearing that there are others now who are mm-hmm. who are uh, contacting them. And we'll talk about who the Amazione are um, uh, later on. Um, sharing Christ with Amazione for 29 years, Greg and Carlene transitioned their ministry with Z- Zima back to the U.S. in 2022, and they currently serve as Zima's home office directors. And Zima stands for Zion Evangelical Ministries of Africa. Uh-huh. And I remember when you first told me about this, I thought Zion was about Israel. So what That's in right. the world is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'll have to give you a history lesson. Uh, oh, it's okay. That. So um, there are approximately about 20 million uh, people that call themselves Amazayoni that live in southern Africa. Okay. And it's a Zulu word, and it means people of Zion. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. But it has nothing to do with Israel, uh-huh. and it has everything to do with a town north of Chicago called Zion, Illinois. That was started in 1900 by a guy named John Alexander Dowie, uh-huh. who had a, a ministry in Chicago mm-hmm. uh, during the World's Fair. Huh. And then he started a church in 1896. And then he bought up farmland north of Chicago, and he was going to uh, set up the Zion cities all over the world Hmm. where the church ran the city. Hmm. But he started in 1900, and he, because of his influence with the Chicago World's Fair, there were um, people from different parts of the world that uh, followed Dowie's teaching, which was basically salvation in Jesus Christ. That if you follow Jesus, you live a holy life, and that God had the power to heal people, so mm. he would pray for the sick. And so this teaching spread, and he also was kind of innovative. He would put out 750,000 newsletters, or Leaves of Healing it was called, mm. a year mm. that went all around the world. Mm. And so um, this teaching made it to South Africa. And in 1904, he sent a missionary, Daniel Bryant, and began to uh, establish and and work with uh, uh, church leaders that were following this teaching. Dowie died in 1907. Bryant returned back to Zion City in Illinois, and um, the work just exploded Hmm. in in Southern Africa. And I, I don't know if you want me to keep going on some of the detail about the the characteristics of the of the church movement, but well, I'll, we'll come to that. So let me okay. let me let me stop you there because we got to figure out how you got into the story. <laughs> so uh, so let's let's work back. So um, you were telling me you came to the Lord in, in college at the age of twenty, right? That's correct. Uh-huh. And you met your wife at Intervarsity Christian Fellowship, which um, yep. uh, is, I guess, a terrific um, parachurch ministry in which many people meet. Meet yeah. their spouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's where we met. And we were both um, involved, and I was in leadership at the time. And I was three years older than her, so she came in as a freshman. But uh, I was in going into the physical therapy program, uh-huh. and she was pre physical therapy. I see. So. People were kind of introducing her and saying, oh, you need to meet Greg. Uh-huh. <laughs> Very good. So now I also noticed, you mentioned Chicago. I also noticed that Moody uh, Bible Institute apparently has at least a partnership or a relationship or a connection to you. Is that is that right or is that just – this is on your web page. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So is is that go back to the time in the 1900s or – No, it, um, Dowie recent? and, and – um, 
Moody were contemporaries of each other. Okay. But no, it doesn't go back to that point. But I think it was in 1995, mm-hmm. we had a um, team from Moody Bible Institute that was led by Ray Badgerow, mm-hmm. and he brought about 17 or 18 students, and they spent six weeks in um, doing the work with us amongst the Amazoni and and. South Africa, and also we did a trip into Malawi. I see. And I think that that's where the work began to uh, open up, that it, it, it got outside of just Zion, Illinois, and it became more known that, hey, this is something that God's doing, and we need to partner and get together. Hmm. And so one of the exp- uh, things that uh, Dr. Badgero said to us at that time, he said that he's been all over Africa, and that... Um, he said that he's never seen a mission organization that has the potential to touch the continent of Africa like Zima does hmm. because of the open door that we have with the Amazoni. Huh. So this is the, uh, the Amazoni, is, we've suggested, live in many different countries. Is that right? That's correct. So, um, and I, I think I've, uh, I've mentioned Zambia and Mozambique and South Africa, and I think you mentioned Uganda and Kenya have come are coming into the mix. Is that right? Just in the last six to eight months, we began huh. to get correspondence from uh, Zionists up in that area. Area asking for us to come and bring Bible teaching hmm. to them. So this is a, a, I guess, a teaching and discipleship and evangelistic ministry. How, is it more teaching and discipleship than evangelism, or is it a mix? Because in Africa, I mean, it yeah. could be all of that. You're right. So now this goes back to your um, podcast that you did in 2022, okay, with the two uh, uh, pastors from right. South Africa. Sure, yep. And one of the things that um, I noticed when I listened to that was mm-hmm. that it, they're accurate in that the, the Amazoni churches of the African Independent Church Movement, they skew the um, numbers uh-huh. for the amount of Christian churches. But one of the things that is known is that uh, many in the Amazoni movement are syncretistic. Mm-hmm. And so where they have um, combined a form of Christianity with their traditional African religion, which is the appeasing of the spirits of their dead relatives mm. to bring good luck and keep bad luck away. Mm. And so um, historically, the Amazoni have been closed to outside organization or churches coming to them. Mm. And, and the reason that is is because the approach that they've done is that they will – um, go and share the gospel mm-hmm. with them, and then they will, if they become followers of Jesus, they say, okay, now you got to get out of the Zionist church. Mm-hmm. And so the Zionist churches historically haven't been open to them. Our approach is different. Mm-hmm. With Zima, we have an historical connection with the church that started the movement. And so our approach, our ethos of our ministry is we tell them, no, stay, stay Zionist. We're not trying to make Western churches or plant Western churches, mm-hmm. but let's get back to the true teaching of Zion, and that's the Word of God and the authority of Jesus Christ, and mm-hmm. building a trust relationship with them. And they are just open mm-hmm. to those who come as representatives of Zion, and they cross that bridge, and they immediately have an open door because... They, there's a trust relationship that's that's been developed over the years. So I mean, I've mentioned several countries here. I, I don't think I've mentioned Zimbabwe. Are they in the mix as well? Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, Eswatini, Lesotho, uh, Botswana. They, we don't know how far they go up north. I see. But in the in the beginning. The reason that it spread that way was because many of the men were coming down and working in the mines in Johannesburg Mm -hmm. back in the 1900s, and Mm -hmm. that uh, after they would would go back to their they they become followers of Zion teaching, and then they would take that teaching back to their home countries. So, um, uh, and and you all are responsible for 89 Bible schools around? Is that number still right? Uh, 89 Bible schools in 2,400 So I just got the latest statistics, and we're at 86 uh, Bible schools. Okay. They're they're satellite schools. Mm -hmm. Um, We have about 2,500 students this year. Okay. Uh, The school started in 1995, was Mm -hmm. the very first school that was started. 
Um, and it was interesting. We our, our idea at that time there was only four families that were working with Zima at that time, mm. but our idea at that time was to have centers and that they would come to us. And um, we almost immediately realized that that wasn't going to work <laughs> yeah. because they were coming from seven, eight hours away, mm. and then after, after a while that they'd be coming for that, that, that distance, they would then come to us and say, hey, there's 30 or 40 other pastors that would love to be here that can't afford it. Could you come and start a Bible school in our area? Hmm. And so that's how it began to slowly uh, grow into what it is today, and that's satellite schools that are uh, pretty much if that there's a group of, of Zion leaders that contact us and say that they would like to have a school in their area, we say, well, you organize it, and then we'll bring the teachers to you with the lessons and all of that sort of thing. But they've got to organize the plate, the venue, and, and, and advertise for it. Interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned, I, I think, ancestors and in, in, in the syncretism. That uh, that's not that unusual in certain parts of the world. I mean, I think of Asia, where ancestors mm-hmm. association with ancestors is a is a big deal. Um, I guess my question is this: you know, um, part of part of the reason we do these podcasts is to help people get a picture of what the church around the world is like, and particularly what particular cultures are mm-hmm. are experiencing. Um, what else perhaps marks the syncretism that uh, that an indigenous African person would would have uh, that uh, uh, that I imagine is part of of um, of the challenge of ministering in this area? Yeah. So a couple of the things that come to mind is that if if they're sick mm-hmm. or if things aren't going well that then their ancestors are not happy with them. Hmm. And that they then will go to a, uh, a witch doctor, and they will then get a message of what is the problem, what it, who someone's causing this, this issue. Mm-hmm. And so they'll go and get that information, and then they will say that um, your aunt or your grandfather or whatever is hungry, mm-hmm. and that you need to make a sacrifice. Hmm. And so they'll have a sacrifice of a, of a sheep or a goat or a cow or something along those lines to appease that spirit. And then they will then wear a skin bracelet um, on their wrist, and that will signify to them to remind the ancestors that they have um, Done what they needed to do. They've responded. They've responded. Right? Yeah, interesting. So, so um, yeah, I, I I tell people that in different parts of the world, the way in which the whole spirit world is seen is very very different. I mean, in the West, mm-hmm. in many places, people don't even recognize that yeah. spirits exist and that kind of thing. And then in other parts of the world, they're very very present. Uh, I remember my first. Um, Awareness of this was actually when I, before I was a believer, I was in Guatemala and we visited a place called Chichi Castanango, which mm-hmm. has a syncretism with the with the indigenous Indians who are in <laughs> in Guatemala, and uh, you know they had they were burning incense and mm-hmm. had all kinds of things going on, and and I, I'm going, this is very very different than the world that I live in. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's even a um, what part of their belief is that if a snake comes to their hut, then that's an ancestor that's come to bring a message. Oh, wow. So that's part of their, their, their belief system. Mm-hmm. So, the, so <laughs> the, the, the issue then is that that's part of the church experience right. of, of the Amazonia, of some of them, not mm-hmm. all of them, right. but some of them. And um, they will have um, uh, prophets who will receive messages from the ancestors and then they will then give that to that person. And as part of the service, they will have a, a sacrifice that takes place that goes on during their service, as well as they'll have communion or baptism and Christians singing and the that's Bible. That's what syncretism is, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, it's a, yeah. it, it's a mix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know what's been fascinating for me over the decades that I was teaching is that during the schools, um, so let me let me back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we 
do is that we get invited to the churches. When they hear about these representatives of Zion coming, they invite us to their church services, which I, I don't know if you've had the experience of going uh, for seven or eight hours in a church service, but that's how they, they, they do it for 11 o'clock at night till about six in the morning. Oh, so it's through the evening. It's through the evening. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. another yeah. difference. You have okay. to be a little bit energetic yeah, exactly. when you're preaching yeah. at 2 in the morning. Yeah, I guess you get a nap before the service yeah. or something. Yeah. Or yeah. during it. Or during. <laughs> <laughs> we probably shouldn't go there, but anyway. Right. <laughs> um, and so, so they will, they will do their services and their program and that sort of thing, and then they will look to us and say, okay, it's your turn now. Hmm. And so we don't put down what they're doing, but what we do is we, again, we lift up the authority of the Bible, we lift up the authority of Jesus, and we then stay around and they have a meal afterwards, of mm -hmm. course, in their, con in their culture, and then we and begin to engage and talk to them and invite them to the Bible schools. And then that's how the relationships are developed. But one of the most asked questions that I, I got in my, early, in my years of being a teacher in the schools was, what does the Bible have to say about ancestor worship? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the way that – and, it, and it's, no, it's in a non-confrontational way, so mm -hmm. we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, we, and I would ask them, well, well, what verses do you use to support it? And they have verses hmm. that they use to support it. I don't know if I can the, – the passage in Ezekiel, mm -hmm. prophesy over the dry bones, mm -hmm. uh, that's one passage, and they would say that. And then I would say, well, let's look at the context of yeah. that. You know? And then they use the First Thessalonians passage of do not be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. They say, see, we're trying not to be ignorant about that. We're teaching our children mm -hmm. that this is what you do when to uh, those who, of our relatives who have passed away. And again, you, you then go in and you uh, give the context of it and help them to see um, what that passage means. And so um, – and then – and it's a process yeah. that – of, of, of them letting go of that and seeing that, okay, these are things – we're doing things that aren't pleasing to God, mm -hmm. and so we need, to, we need to stop doing those things. Mm. Um, a story that I liked telling is that um, after about the third year at Sunbury, which is the camp that I lived at and we had one of the schools there, there was about 30 students, and they wanted to – have more discussion about what the Bible says about ancestral worship. And so the, after class, the teacher stayed around, the students stayed around, and we had that discussion for a couple hours. And then one of the older bishops in the back, he stood up and he, um, he said, I, I think I get it, what you white missionaries are saying to us. You're saying that when we become followers of Jesus, there's things in our culture that we need to leave behind. Mm -hmm. But then, then, then he said this, he said, and he looked at us and he said, when you became a follower of Jesus, what did you leave in your culture? Mm -hmm. And he sat down. And that question has affected me <laughs> for the last 25 sure. years. Yeah, so. very interesting. Do you know why they worship in the evening? So um, f culturally, mm -hmm. there's a belief that the spirits are more active. Hmm. So those who are not followers of Jesus, they believe that the spirits are more active at midnight. Interesting. At night, so, so uh, I mean, I, again, part of part of why we do these is to have people understand the way different people in different parts of the world see the world and what goes on in it and mm -hmm. how they perceive that, and and uh, and then the the challenges to ministry that come as a result of of some of these differences, some of which are are benign, but some of which actually do have issues tied to them that, that need attention. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's interesting. So, so you've got the Bible schools. Is, um, are there just, for lack of a better description, missionaries who work in the area as well, or is everything tied to these Bible schools? So we have 18 families that are working with Zima, mm -hmm. um, but we – part of that – 18 families is that we also get um, missionaries seconded from other mission agencies. Mm -hmm. So TEAM, SIM, DMG, which is a German mission. Mm -hmm. So we have missionaries from those missions that have seen the tremendous open door that we have and mm -hmm. have loaned us missionaries. And so 
Um, most of our missionaries are are in the South African region, mm-hmm. and then we have a missionary in Eswatini, mm-hmm. and then the missionaries that are in the Johannesburg area, which is in the northern part of South Africa, sure. will go into. Uh, they've been going into Zimbabwe, and then also now they're going into Malawi. So, is there a particular set of regions in South Africa that get a lot of attention, or is it spread across the country? It's spread across the country. Yeah, Johannesburg. Cape Town, Durban, and in, in between, and mm-hmm. now spread all. Yeah, it's uh, South Africa is a f- fascinating country. I go every other summer, basically our summer uh, okay. there, and uh, I've been. There's certain places I haven't been. I've never been to Durban. I've been. Uh, I've been to Cape Town regularly, Johannesburg, Pretoria pretty mm-hmm. regularly. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, that's the. That's the normal swing for me. Carlene and I were uh, based about an hour north of Durban, mm-hmm. so we 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 got some really nice weather then for the most part yeah, in that yeah. area. <laughs> now it's interesting because um, most people don't realize this, but there's a significant Indian population in parts of South Africa as well, mm-hmm. and. Uh, um, but I'm assuming that th- that that's a whole completely different cultural and and demographic um, presence in South Africa as opposed to the to the indigenous African free independent churches or is, is there that's correct. We have been um, partnering with uh, uh, Indian pastor up in the northern KwaZulu Natal area hmm. that has been working with us and has been teaching. Um, with us in the Zebs program, and the Zebs is what the school is called, Zion Evangelical Bible School, mm, mm. and so that's probably our only contact with them. There, yeah. there, there isn't that I'm aware of. There's no Indian um, people that are in the, involved in the Zionist churches. Interesting. And the uh, the uh, and I am again. This is just from memory. I may not be right, but I think it's the Durban area in particular where the Indian population is concentrated. Yeah, in that KwaZulu Natal area. Uh-huh. And the reason I don't know if you know the history of it, uh-huh. but they came over as indentured servants to work in the sugarcane fields. Oh, really? No, I didn't know yeah. that. And so they. This is what I've been told: is uh-huh. that the, it's the largest population of Indians outside of the country of India. Yeah, are living in that. In yeah, I mean, when I was Africa. when I was first being told this, I was totally surprised. Of course, I'm in the I'm in the middle part of the country for the most part. Like mm-hmm. I said, Johannesburg, Pretoria, Cape Town, and so I don't. I've never been to the to the eastern coast of India, which is what we're talking about. So that's uh, correct. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So. So, um, so what? Uh, uh, what's it like to come out of the West? And well, you know what? I forgot that you have a story to tell. So, how did you get into this to begin with? I mean, what's what's a nice intervarsity Christian guy? And how did he? How does he end up in South Africa ministering to indigenous Africans? So uh, I won't give you a too long a version, but I'll okay. give you a little bit of the version. Um, so in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, I went on a trip with Operation Mobilization down to Ciudad Juarez, mm. and we did a blitzkrieg of, a, of the town. There was uh, college students from Canada, from the uh, United States, and from Mexico that came together and, and worked with uh, churches. And then from that experience, I re- began to receive newsletters from uh, agencies that were working with the Muslim population. Hmm. And so I was praying f- through those each time that I would get it. And one of the um, main prayer requests was pray for more workers. Hmm. And it wasn't like God spoke to me and yeah. verbally, but it was like, well, Greg, why not you? Why don't you go there? And so I always had a desire to tell people about Jesus, and I knew that with my physical therapy that I could get into a, a closed country. So when Carly and I were dating, uh, and she knew the desire that I have, and, and she also was a physical therapist, and so we decided that that's what we believe that God wanted us to do, was hmm. to use our physical therapy to get into a country, a Muslim country. And um, after we graduated, uh, back in those days, you had to get your school debts paid off. Yeah, so right. Yeah, well, the people debt. are still doing that today. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I needed Bible training, uh-huh. and so um, 
I, I was still full-time working. Uh, we had a child. My wife was pregnant with our second uh, child. And I went full-time to Moody Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was called the Advanced Studies Program, which has become their master's level program. Mm -hmm. And I, we, I did those courses, and my wife took some courses. And we went to the Missions Week. And we, which is a big deal at Moody, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it uh, they, the they, agencies they have, yeah, they're everywhere. They're all there. Yep. Yep. And so, Carlene and I went to the uh, seminars that were that they had, and then we went up to and visited the agencies that were working with Muslim countries, Muslim people, and um, and it was amazing what they told us. So we went up to one table, and they told us that uh, no, that you guys are too old. And I was only 29 at the time, but I, I we just couldn't believe that's what they File said. File for Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> and so then we went out to another uh, table, and they said, um, you have too many children. <laughs> and <we're, laughs> okay. And then we went up to a third table, and they told us that um, we needed more education. And so like three strikes, and you're out. Yeah. And we left there like, okay, God, what do you – we thought this was the direction you want us to go. So this was at the Moody – this was at the that was Mission at Week. Yeah. Wow, okay. And and just so you know that after that, as we became missionaries, and we would talk to missionaries from those agencies, mm -hmm. and they just can't believe that's what was told to us. Hmm. And we said, well, we can't believe it either, mm -hmm. but may, that was God's way of getting Interesting. us to where you want us to be. And we had friends from InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at our campus that were home on furlough hmm. from South Africa. Hmm. And we invited them to come over for dinner. And we came over. They had a little child, and our little one played together. And they showed us. Uh, in those days, it was the old slideshow presentation. Yeah, yeah, you know? okay. yeah. And afterwards, they said, you "If know, you're under 20, have someone explain to you what that is." <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so then they just said to us, "It'd be nice to have a couple like you to work with." Hmm. And so that night, you know, Carlene and I began to talk about it. We began to pray and research it. And three and a half years later, we were in South Africa. Interesting. So, um, so, so your intent had been to go minister in a Muslim in a closed mu Muslim country. That's correct. And and you obviously got directed in a different direction. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, as I say, the rest is history, yeah, right? Yeah. For your for you and your family. Yeah. You know what's interesting that I've um, in my. Uh, networking and, and getting to know people from different agencies and that sort of thing is that um, I don't know how much the uh, listeners will know, but but the Muslim the Islam is 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 going farther and farther south, sub-Saharan Africa, yes. and it's going into they're pouring millions of dollars into establishing footholds into the southern sub-Saharan African countries. Like in Malawi, we I was there about ten times in my early days of ministry, and pretty much their tar their goal was to have a, a mosque in each village, hmm. and they've done it. Hmm. And um, and then in discussing as missionaries and with other agencies, one of the things that we've talked about is who's there that's going to be um, witnessing to their neighbors, hmm. and the Zionists are in those villages, hmm. and so we just think, you know, is this uh, you know, for such a time as this, hmm. is God opening up the hearts of the Amazoni people to His Word, so that they are becoming followers of Jesus and will be able to witness to their Muslim neighbors. So, what is the tribal makeup of the Amazon? I mean, are they considered to be their own tribe, or are they, or is there a mix of tribal? Yeah, it is. It's, it crosses the barrier. It yeah. crosses the barriers. There's no barriers uh, in South Africa. It's all the different. So kinds. this is a particularly, uh, I can say, what cross-tribal, denominational uh, that's, movement, basically. That, that's correct. And just so to help the listeners to understand about the Zionist movement, and one of the things that we've noticed about, uh, particularly the Western. Um, churches in, in South Africa is their understanding of the Zionist movement is that they believe that it's just one denomination. Mm -hmm. The ZCC, I don't know if you've heard of that, the Zion Christian Church, which mm. has about a million members, mm. and they go up to a place called Moriah every Easter. 
and that's a huge denomination. Mm -hmm. But there's actually 6,000 different Zion denominations wow. in South Africa. And they each have their own bishop, and mm -hmm. they have their own name of their church in a different uniform and that sort of thing. So does that uh, – now, I, the natural question that comes to me in that kind of a context is, do those tend to be formed by tribe? Is that part of what creates those differences? So what happened in the beginning? Now you have to uh -huh. go back a little bit. No in problem. Is yep. That um, th they e immediately began to break away from each other. Mm -hmm. So there was some early leaders, guys that uh, Larue, Buchler, Mahan were some of the early uh, white people that were followers of the Zionist movement, and Konyana and Latuli Gobese were some of the African leaders in the beginning, and they immediately broke away from each other. Hmm. And, and I believe that that's also part of the African culture, mm -hmm. is that, let's say you were the bishop. Right, right. And if I was a younger guy, yeah. and I, after a certain amount of time, I would say, well, I, I want to have my own church, and uh -huh. so I would take my members, and I would start my Zion denomination. I would change the name a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe change the uniform a bit, and then I would have my church, and I would become the bishop of that church. Interesting. So um, uh, I've been waiting to ask this question. I haven't been sure how to ask it, and that is, so you said there were, there were white leaders and there were African leaders as well. Mm -hmm. How much did... Is the cultural reality, and now I'm thinking particularly of South Africa, although it's probably true across the continent to some degree, how much were the, uh, were the racial divides that existed in the continent at play in some of this? Yeah. So what's particular about uh, Zionist teaching from the beginning was that they were egalitarian and cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. So there was a reception of all the different races, mm -hmm. and there was no s status there higher. Was, okay. And so there was a, a unity there. Okay? So it was counter... So that was the beginning. So it was counter-cultural to what was going on in South Africa, for example. That's correct. Okay. Okay, at the beginning. Yeah. Um, now, what I have been amazed at in my 30 years of being over there is how forgiving the African people are, mm -hmm. because we were received with open arms. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think was significant in those early years of the other missionaries that started, and Carly and I when we went, is that we were willing we, – we were instructed that we needed to learn their language, mm -hmm. we needed to learn their culture. Hmm. And so one of the things that my wife and I did in the early days was we would take our family and go live with a, a Zulu pastor. Hmm. And we would do what they were doing mm -hmm. and learn their culture, learn their language, and, and live with them. And I remember in the early days that I would go for a whole weekend and go out and uh, participate with a family and have the service and that sort of thing. And one time I was in a hut, and um, it was in the early days when I didn't know the language so well. Mm -hmm. And a person would come in, and they would say hello to me, and I would greet them in Zulu. And then they would talk to my the coworker that I had, uh, Kuba. And they would talk for a while, and then they, he would get up and greet me, say goodbye, and then he'd go out, and another person would come in. And after a while, I finally asked Kuba, I said, what's, what's going on? And he just said, no, they... They couldn't believe that a white man was going to sleep in a black man's bed, and so they wanted to come and see with their own eyes. Mm -hmm. And so, I I think as if if you go there with an open heart, an open mind, and you're not trying to change them mm -hmm. to become Western, and you become a learner and learn from them, that they are so receptive to us then bringing the Bible teaching. Yeah, there's to I mean, there's terrific hospitality that runs through the culture that yes. I've seen and, uh, um, and just a graciousness, really, that, that runs through as well that you, you sense and pick up when you're there. Yeah. And it's uh, – yeah, we 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 really do. Um, with everything that South Africa in particular has been through, we really do appreciate uh, uh, people who we know, both both whites and and blacks, who we've gotten to know, who are connected to the church and yeah. the churches that we minister to. It's a fascinating place to uh, 
to be. Um, so what would you say uh, you've learned as a result of the ministry that you've been a part of? Because I imagine uh, hmm. just a little bit of a culture difference. <laughs> very much. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Um, so one of the significant things, I think, for me was the that when I went there, that I went there because I love the Mazayoni people, and so I could I could have a meal with uh, with witch doctors, mm -hmm. and I could have meals with prophets who mm -hmm. were receiving their messages, and and that was and there wasn't any um, uh, there, there wasn't any emotional baggage mm -hmm. that I had because I wanted to love them, build relationships with them, and share the truth, mm -hmm. but uh, but giving. Allowing them to wrestle with the truth and with and, and allowing the the word of God and the spirit of God to work within that person. Mm -hmm. And so when I come back here to America, and now we're here totally in in the country and the culture, um, I know that there's topics that that are very heightened mm -hmm. emotionally, mm -hmm. and that and especially as Christians that we get upset about certain things and. So, one of our messages that my wife and I have tried to give and to talk with people, and last semester we taught a class at Moody Bible Institute, Intercultural Engagement, hmm. and we were teaching the students that they have different cultures all around them. Oh, yeah. I'm In America, it's, it's amazing. Well, I tell people when you ask the question, so what's the culture? Like I said, you've already, you've already fogged up the conversation. It's not culture singular, it's cultures. Yes. And they rub against each other. I compare them to plate tectonics. <laughs> you know, they rub against each other. You build up enough pressure, you get a reaction. Yes. And, yeah. and so um, that, that, yeah. that is pluralism, is that mix, that multiple mix yeah. that yeah. you have to deal with. And Africa is certainly that way. You've got multiple languages in any given country. That's right. So uh, um, eleven national languages. Eleven in South, na South Africa. Alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so, um, so, so the thing is, is how how do we build bridges, mm -hmm. take down walls, mm -hmm. and build a trust relationship where you can go out and have coffee with somebody that's from a different political or different social agenda perspective, but have a conversation and mm -hmm. share, and not try to talk them into believing what you do, but just share and listen to their story and share your story mm -hmm. and then to part ways but still be able to have a communication. So that's what I – Yeah, when we, do, when we do our cultural engagement stuff and we talk about difficult conversations, we talk about um, learning to become a good listener and ask questions mm -hmm. and find out where the person is coming from and why. I call it getting a spiritual GPS reading on someone. Yes. And you're, and you're just listening for what drives them, what they're concerned about, where they're coming from. Because the better you understand the person, you're actually mm -hmm. in a better place to interact with them. That's right. And, uh, and so that becomes a very key way of thinking about how to do – really how to share your faith in this context. And I say, if you show an interest in someone else mm -hmm. and by asking them questions, wanting to hear their story, et cetera, and putting what I call your doctrinal meter on mute, you're not going to turn it off because it's there, uh -huh. uh, and your first response isn't to rebut what you hear, your first response is to actually draw closer to the person and get to know them That's right. better, then you put yourself in a position when it's your turn, you've set an environment for that kind of a conversation which allows you to share That's right. as they've shared. And it just changes the dynamic of what's going on yes. between people when you operate that way. Yeah. And giving, giving, giving the space for God to do His work. Exactly right. You know? Yeah, so. yeah, and it's his timing and it is sense that we uh, that we do it. So, um, so you've come back from South Africa and you're now here, uh -huh. and it says you're uh, serving as Zima's home office director. So, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. office, home office isn't a big place, I don't think. So, what does that actually mean? Yeah. So. Um, what happened in our, our ministry is that um, in 2018, I took over as field, o field office director, mm -hmm. and then in 2019, our home office director resigned. Mm. And so my wife and I raised our hand, and so we were carrying both responsibilities mm. while we were there in South Africa. And um, so it's 
So then in 2021, um, my wife's parents needed uh, some assistance, and mm-hmm. so Carlene came back here. And then in 20, January of 2023, we finally came over um, where we're full-time now here. And so we got our feet wet a little bit in those mm-hmm. early days, and so now our concentration is networking hmm. and going out to churches, uh, coming to Bible schools, mm-hmm. and having the opportunity to tell the story of what God's doing. Because I, th- I, and I know I appreciate what you're doing in the Table Podcast is that you're helping believers to see of what God's doing worldwide. Exactly. And it's huge. Yeah, exactly. It's so yeah. Huge. Most stories so. people don't even know or are aware of, but he is quite active and it's it's in certain parts of the world it's exciting to see, even in the midst of some cases of of real challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I take it you're you're uh, you're over Overseeing and encouraging people who are in the ministry, the families, et cetera? Is that basically that's, the role? That's correct. And so I do it a lot of administration, answering uh-huh. emails, uh-huh. And solving, helping to solve some issues, or pointing people to the right people that can solve their, mm-hmm. their issues that they're having, and being in communication with the field um, uh, office director on a weekly basis and the board chairman. And, you know, doing so you were overseas for what, um, what, 20? <laughs> 29. 29 years? Yeah, yeah. So what was it like to come back to the States? <laughs> um, there was culture shock when you came yes, back? Yes, very much so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much so. So in the, in, when I first realized that we were going to be making the transition, it was hard because mm-hmm. that became home for Carly Oh, and sure, I. yeah. And that was where our friends and there. And there's a, a, a pace of life that you – I understand. To, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. That you have. And um, we really enjoyed, we really loved what we did. Yeah. And we loved the people we were with, and we loved the Mazayoni, and we love the culture. That There's a reason why you spend seven or eight hours in a church service, because of the community <laughs> values that that represents. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, but making this transition, um, God has given us peace mm-hmm. about that this is what he's asking us to do at, the, at this time, and that um, we are um, grabbing hold of, of what God's given us. And so opportunities like this get us really excited. Uh-huh. And I, just a sh- really short story, um, we were trying to make a little bit more contact um, with Dallas the mm-hmm. Elijah Seminary. Mm-hmm. And so we were trying to um, be part of the WEC, I think. Yeah, week, yeah, you know, yeah. Where right. you have the mission agencies. Yeah. And it just wasn't happening, didn't have the right emails and that sort of thing. So we decided to come a little bit early today. And um, uh, we were in the, I don't know which building it was, but we were looking at the directory, and a gentleman came up and asked us, Do we need help? And so we told him who we were, and it was Dr. Ortiz. Mm. And so we ended up having a great conversation, and he introduced us to Shannon. And so we had a a 30-minute discussion with her. And so I see God opening doors for us to just have opportunities to tell the story of what he's doing amongst the Amazonian people. Yeah, it's a fascinating part of the world, um, South Africa and the southern southern part of of Africa. It's a, it's becoming a challenging part of the world as well with mm-hmm. all the issues that there yes. that exist. The as you've already talked about the influx of Islam coming to south is a challenge and uh, um, they obviously have had a some parts of the African continent have had a very tumultuous history over the yeah. last several decades, and coping with that, it's just it is a it is a fascinating, I could say, part of the world, and to mm-hmm. to hear about ministry that is um, <laughs> that's connecting with um, with people who are from Africa and and the reception that you've managed to get mm-hmm. um, is. Um, is encouraging to hear. Yeah, one of the things that I I, I don't know if I explained also is that out of our uh, eighty 
s- teachers, mm-hmm. 60 of them are African nationals. And oh, so wow. God is really doing a movement where he's raising up people from within that are ministering to their own. So the, so you mean they're running the schools and they're that kind of thing? Yeah, wow. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Greg, I want to thank you for coming in and talking with us and sharing you know, a little bit about a small piece, <laughs> an important piece of what's going on in, in Southern Africa, not just South Africa. And uh, and the opportunity that represents, and the history that is behind it, and the um, the way in which you all have shown what I would call relational sensitivity in mm-hmm. in thinking about ministry. That's a value that we have at the center, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's it's a real pleasure to to hear your story. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's great yeah. to be here. Yeah, and we're glad that you were able to join us on the table. If you want to see more episodes of the table, you had a voice dot dts dot edu slash table podcast and as you heard we've done other podcasts about south africa that discuss uh different aspects of the makeup of the country and and what has gone on there the history which most people are aware of has been at different points tumultuous and so it's interesting to hear how the church has coped with all the changes that have come really in the last several decades there in south africa so we thank you for joining us we hope you'll join us again soon and uh, welcome to the table. We discuss issues of God and culture and where we look at the relevance of theology to everyday life. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.